Hello and hi. We touched down in the uh, Western Hemisphere, looking at uh, Latin America as we uh, begin the home stretch of the course. And uh, while I set this up, you can turn to the um, obligatory regional map. This one here is on uh, pages 456 and 457. And some of you, um, if you had any recent high school geography courses, may see some differences in the um, in, in what countries are included uh, on uh, on this map, and and what I'm getting at is um, lately geographers crafting these, you know, crafting these textbooks have um, delimited the map differently than the um, than the traditional standpoint, and specifically, what I'm uh, um, uh, what I'm getting at there is expanding the limits. They're expanding the limits of North America uh, to the um, southern Mexican border, which may which may be due uh, to immigration issues and free trade agreements, right? Uh, but we're not going to do that here, right? I have not been doing that over the years, and I'm not I'm, I'm not about to begin to do it. So you're going to see you you know you see Mexico. Uh, included and you know that's the um it's been a traditional way of categorizing the um what we're going to talk about here latin america right and this is pr uh, primarily due to or my viewpoint of keeping it um in agreement with it, our authors is just due to cultural and um linguistic relationships that i feel mexico has more in common with um Latin America uh, than they do with uh, Des Moines, Iowa. I work for another institution and um, one of their discussion questions uh, is, um, I could do it with you guys too, but I, I nevertheless, it's uh, where would you categorize Mexico and Central America? And some categorize it with North America, but um, they don't know this, but uh, they really have a got to have a convincing, uh, convincing answer for that when they get the full amount of points. But uh, we're not doing that here. So um, yeah, textbooks should be open for you folks to have it. Page four fifty six, four fifty seven, and um, get the screen share up and um, start. We'll dive into this. There we go. Okay. Chapter 11. Some of the major heads up terms here we want to look at. The uh, Mayas. Uh, this these uh, this people group came out of um, Guatemala and El Salvador. Uh, the Incas, all right, the In along with the Incas too, I suppose. Uh, the Incas were in that particular area as well. Uh, the Aztecs, right? The Aztecs, um, ethnic groups of Central America, right, Mexico. Uh, the Treaty of Tordesillas, right, I wish I could say that better, the Treaty of Tordesillas, uh, was a demarcation line going down to, I think it was the 46 degrees west longitude, and east of that would be, was a lot of the Portugal, and west of that, Spain. You had Two Spanish-speaking Catholic countries, um, you know, vying for land on the same continent. And rumor has it, uh, one of the popes uh, thought that that would be an atrocity if two Catholic countries, right, began to fight each other. So the uh, Treaty of Tordesillas, legend has it, emanated from the Vatican. Okay. Uh, the Quichas, the Quicha Indians, right? These were Incans, uh, Inca, uh, Inca Indians and, uh, set up the uh, Quicha language. And then you have the encomienda system, right? Encomienda system, basically a, 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 a Spanish feudal system, except they didn't have warlords and vassals and knights and, and, uh, well, 
peasants. The peasants were the uh, captured slaves. So you have that, the haciendas. Hacienda would be the uh, production estates where the work was done. Uh, the peninsulares. Peninsulares, these are the folks at the top of the, we saw like a caste order when we looked at South Asia and India. The peninsulares would be anyone who was born in Spain that was here in the New World. Vice royalties, these were administrative divisions. And then the Monroe Doctrine. Monroe, Monroe Doctrine was James Monroe, his administration, uh, looking at you know the resources in Central America, Latin America, and uh, letting the Europeans know that we'd like for you to stay out of our backyard. Uh, if you could do that, we will not get involved in European affairs. Ejidos, ejidos. These were co-ops owned by the uh, the uh, Mexican government. Uh, the Macoladoras, the Macoladoras. These were, um, and I'm, I'm going to spend some time on this, not only in the lecture too, but with your videos. You got a, kind of a couple of videos I want you to take a look at. Um, the Macoladoras are um, places like Nike, right? Nike and um, um, uh, IKEA, they would set up shop in uh, across the northern border of Mexico with part the places where you know you uh, that uh, specialize in assembly parts and so forth. So, and uh, they were designed to intercept uh, potential uh, illegals going into the United States and providing work. The Macoladoras. Uh, favelas, these are like shanty towns, slums in Latin America. Uh, Mercosur, I'm trying to think ahead here. I don't know if I really, Mercosur would be like the European Union, Asian, right, uh, in um, Southeast Asia. Mercosur would be uh, not so much as concerned about communism, although there was that element to it, but it's basically a tr an economic uh, consortium for Latin America, Mercosur. And then uh, FARC and the AUC, the AUK, uh, the FARC was uh, left-wing armed forces of Colombia. Uh, they were in the land redistribu redistribution and also drug trafficking. Same thing with uh, AUC, more right-wing, um, Colombia paramilitary groups, uh, and, and also drug traffickers. So here we want to explain Latin America's cultural history, uh, understand the origins of uh, and the after effects of U.S. involvement in the region. Haven't seen that so far, right, as we've been circling the globe. And uh, appreciate the economic development of Mexico and Brazil. I'm going to, as I do, hone in on a couple of what I think are the major areas. Sometimes I do the interesting things to me. Macoladoras may not be the uh, uh, front burner to a lot of geographers and teachers, but uh, I find it interesting. And uh, where else am I going with this? Yeah, we're going to discuss U.S. drug and immigration policy regarding Latin America. Got a couple videos on that. And um, so I think we're gonna, I think the reading might be on that too. So, all right. So let's take a look at this, get into this. And um, well, let me just say this. Just set this up. You can look at your map. Um, and uh, if you've looked at that, just maybe flip through some pages as I talk here for a minute or so. But this area, Latin America, it's marked by profound contrasts in its um, physical and human geography. You have high mountains, uh, tropical rainforests and deserts that are, are found throughout. Uh, populations of the country uh, in the region range from a few hundred thousand in the Caribbean, right? Look at Cuba and you know that, that the islands around that, that, that'd be the Caribbean, in case you didn't know that. Uh, a few thousand in the Caribbean basin to over a hundred million in Brazil, right? Brazil and Mexico, right? One of the reasons why I'm 
focusing on the going to be highlighting those two countries. But um, economic and political power is consolidated uh, in these large urban uh, industrial areas. So prior to the uh, arrival of the um, Europeans, the cultural landscape was influenced by the Maya, Aztec, and Inca. And um, however, uh, the contemporary cultural geography of the region has been profoundly influenced by the Iberian colonists who um, introduced the dominant languages Spanish and Portuguese and the religion Roman Catholicism. The Iberian colonists, of course, Spain and Portugal, right, coming over from the Iberian Peninsula in uh, Western Europe along the Atlantic. So the Spanish uh, introduced the encomienda system uh, to the region whereby lands were allotted to Spaniards who were responsible for exploiting their wealth and uh, had, you know, subsequent jurisdiction over the, uh, the native uh, peoples. And the Portuguese occupation, Portuguese occup occupation of South America was uh, marked by the importation of more than uh, four million slaves from Africa uh, most of whom worked the sugar plantations along the uh, northeastern coast of um, South America. Uh, the British, uh, French, and Dutch established colonies in and on the periphery uh, in, in time, and um, of the uh, certainly of the Caribbean, predominantly in the Caribbean area, and um, which. Uh, you know, is the beginning of your, you know, sugar trade. And, but beginning in the early 1800s, I would say, uh, independent countries began emerging from uh, colonial rule with Mexico and uh, most of Central and South America achieving their independence by the 1830s. Uh, independence in the Caribbean basin uh, came much later. And in some instances, really, uh, not at all, <laughs> okay? Um, and then throughout the region, the post-independence period has been uh, marked by internal tension, uh, political instability, and dictatorships. Let's see what it's all about here. And I'll break out the x-ray. Regional cultural history, right? Regional cultural history. And uh, pre-European peoples. Well, the lasting influence of the Mayas, Aztec, and Inca. Let's look into that. Um, the Incas formed in south of south of modern Peru, and uh, they were warlike. Uh, their influence covered twenty eight hundred uh, miles. Page four sixty eight, figure ten fifteen, uh, on the color coded maps. The keys there, you could see uh, where the uh, the Incas were. Uh, the official language is the Quiche language, which is, um, yep, one of your heads up terms. The Quiche language, you always make, want to make sure these tough words like that are one of the heads up terms. I usually get it right. Quiche language, which is still spoken today. Spanish colonization, Spanish colonization, the Treaty of Tordesillas. The Treaty of Tordesillas established a demarcation line at 46 degrees west longitude between Spain and Portugal. The uh, eastern quarter, the eastern quarter was, um, of South America would go to the interests of Portugal, go to the interests of Portugal. Spanish control. Spanish rule consisted of a geographic system, a geographic system based on mineral exploitation right, and um, transportation to a, a few ports. Large estates engaged in uh, raising livestock and a rigid class structure. The encomienda system was a feudal system, uh, large 
land grants went to nobles and and uh, soldiers, um, church officials uh, who exploit resource wealth and uh, begin to establish settlements. Spanish control agriculture and uh, develop large uh, production estates called haciendas, where they would cultivate the crops, uh, raise uh, livestock for uh, domestic markets. Uh, the natives, of course, as you can probably guess, they were the laborers, right? They were the laborers who lived on the haciendas in exchange for their work. In exchange for their work. Uh, the Peninsulares, these are um, Spanish-born, Spaniard-born in, uh, in Spain, who were living or working in the New World. And they would take the, um, they would take the uh, highest offices. Portuguese colonization. The uh, Portuguese set up a governor in Brazil in 1549. The city of Salvador, the Salvador became the first capital. So figure 10-2, page 457, an inset map. And look at Brazil, easy to find. And along the coast, uh, maybe the northern half of the coast, you can uh, find Salvador. Pardon me. Independence. Independence. And um, here, Spain and Portugal were, were weakened by uh, resisting Napoleon. Uh, new countries emerged in uh, Latin America known as um, Spanish vice royalties, right? These administrative districts. Unfortunately, uh, colonial boundaries were uh, poorly uh, surveyed, causing, causing future problems. We look at my inter, uh, in, introduction to geography course. Um, be teaching that in the spring. Uh, it's amazing how um, people are wedded to their, their boundaries and their properties. Independence from Spain. All right, independence from Spain. Spain, let's break this down a little further. Keep going with this. Mexican independence, right? Mexican independence from Spain, 1821. 1821. And it stretched from the present day southwest border of the United States, which we all know and love, down through the Panamanian border. Uh, Central Amer the Central American region separated from Spain in 1838. So to look at that, you can, you know, again, look at page 457. Find the U.S., our southernmost border, and then go down through Panama. Brazilian independence. Brazilian independence. Brazil actually encouraged immigration. So they would receive immig immigrants from Germany, uh, Italy, and uh, across the Pacific and Japan, you know, in the early 1900s. Continuing external influence, continuing external influence, uh, import substitution. The region's goal, the region's goal was to become less dependent, right? Less dependent on um, selling uh, unprocessed or unrefined raw materials in exchange for high price manufactured goods from industrialized countries. Before we get to global and local change, I just want to go over, as I like to do, um, the climate, right, and uh, population maps and so forth. Turn to page um, 461. Page 461, yeah, climate biome map and on page 460 we have a uh, population distribution map at some juncture i'm going to get there but i think it might be here um tropical climates tropical climates dominate middle america 
um, dominate the Caribbean basin and uh, northern South America. Your arid climates dominate northern Mexico, uh, southern Peru, northern Chile, uh, Patagonia in uh, southern Argentina. Uh, you got your humid mid-latitude climates. They are found in eastern South America and southern Chile. Uh, the collision of tectonic plates, right? The collision of tectonic plates forms the region's dominant uh, physical features. Uh, you have the insular and mainland Middle America uh, has numerous volcanoes, has numerous volcanoes and earthquakes. In fact, and we look at this in the intro to geography class too, that believe it or not, I'm not making this up. Uh, I think the zest on on attempting this is maybe waned, but in the 90s, the thought of maybe moving some of the capitals, some of the capitals like Mexico City, right? Very close to fault lines. Tehran and Iran, that's close to a fault line. Tokyo, right? Um, so there's been, uh, there was talk about, let's move the capitals. And um, logistically, right, that's probably a tall order. But um, yeah, I mean, numerous volcanoes and, and earthquakes in some of these areas. And big cities are close. The uh, Andes Mountains. Andes Mountains um, and the, are, are uh, the world's second highest mountain range. And uh, if you look at your map, it kind of runs the... Um, uh, the length of Western South America, the Andes, and in, f in the interior South America, east east of the Andes, is dominated by broad plateaus uh, and wide river valleys. And of course, the Amazon River Basin, right, is home to the world's largest uh, expanse of tropical rainforest. And soil erosion is a problem for uh, many of the um, region's countries and there's some air and water pollution too that are especially bad in uh, the urban areas. Now economic strength as we start to head into my next major point economic strength within the region has a, a wide range right wide range of from countries like uh, Haiti that are uh, among the world's poorest uh, to economic giants like Brazil. And uh, the, page 460, yeah, look at the population map. I knew it was around here someplace. I wanted to talk about this. Um, the uh, population of the region is concentrated along the near coasts, along or near the coasts, except in, uh, except in Mexico, where the population is uh, concentrated in the central part of the country, right? See Mexico City. While there are many large cities in the region, interaction on a global level is dominated by Mexico City and Sao Paulo, Brazil, right? Again, another reason why, because of time, I'm focusing on those two countries. Uh, natural increase and uh, urbanization rates are generally high throughout the region. So that leads to global and local changes. The Monroe Doctrine, right? The Monroe Doctrine in 1823, the U.S. assumed the role of ge geopolitical leader of um, the Western Hemisphere. And by the early 1900s, there was a growing presence in Latin America uh, by the U.S., uh, the United States and Latin America, right? The United States and Latin America by um, late 1900s. By the late 1900s, Latin America looked to the U.S. for trade, uh, political support, uh, popular culture. Uh, Miami, be you know, they developed strong cultural ties with the uh, city of Miami. Uh, global cities, you have Mexico City and Sao Paulo. Right, Mexico City and Sao Paulo. And I don't think Sao Paulo is on my 
heads up terms. I don't think it is. Sao Paulo is um, SAO space P A U L O. So Mexico City and Sao Paulo, of course, is on your maps too. I guess you could look at those. Sao Paulo, they're the dominant forces uh, responsible for placing Latin America into the, uh, into the global system. Population pressures, again, um, the map on page 460, figure 10-5, uh, natural increase in migration patterns. Down a little bit. Let's go down here with that. Population pressure, natural increase in migration patterns. Um, Southern South America, Southern South America has uh, the uh, low, the slowest, right, the slowest growth. Um, Argentina, Chile, and Uruguay are growing at about one percent population increases a year, which would make their population double over a, a course of about seventy years, right? That's generally where the developing, the developed, the developed world is, including the United States. Um, there are fewer immigration uh, issues in those areas, uh, fewer immigrants from Europe, uh, and uh, there were also wars with uh, one another in those areas too, contributing to um, the 1% uh, uh, population rates in uh, those areas. Argentina, Chile, and then uh, and Uruguay. Move over to Mexico, or move up to Mexico. Political changes. In 1821, independence was gained in Mexico from Spain. Uh, they had stability for you know, roughly 50 years, up to 1871, under the uh, Diaz uh, di dictatorship. Uh, but this plants, his dictatorship was, you know, a typical dictatorship. It, um, you know, brutal, ruthless, plants seeds of Mexican, or Mexican Revolution in 1911. Uh, Ejidos emerged, right? State-owned co-ops. State-owned co-ops that gives landless peasants some control over the land. Regional diversity in Mexico. Uh, Central Mexico is the seat of the population. Uh, political, cultural, and economic activity is there and all revolving around uh, Mexico City. And then you have the um, areas on the, uh, out on the peninsula, the Yucatan Peninsula, uh, you could find uh, Cancun out in the Yucatan, on the Yucatan Peninsula. And <clears throat> East Coast Plains around the Gulf and Yucatan are areas of <clears throat> tourist attractions. And it's a region of oil and uh, natural gas production as well. And then economic development and human landscape. You have uh, the Maquila. The Maquila this is the areas across the uh, northern border with the United States. Uh, the Macuiladoras program, right? The Macuiladoras program of foreign-owned companies uh, import parts for assembly, and you don't have customs duties, right? You don't have customs duties. Uh, the labor is cheap, and fewer environmental regulations are attractive to foreigners and um. You'll tell me about this, right? With a discussion question via your videos, you know. Uh, is it doing much to uh, intercept and keep illegals, you know, and keep immigration down out of the United States? Let's move down to South America and um, the Northern and Andes and subregion. I yeah, I forgot about this area here. I Mexico, Brazil, and I cover the Northern Andes. So you get a little bonus here. Um, 
Central America, let me just set this up. Central America consists of seven countries located on an isthmus extending from Mexico to Colombia. And with the exception of um, Costa Rica and Panama, the countries of this subregion are among the poorest in Latin America. And again, you can look at page 457 between South America and Mexico is this area of Central America. Um, long plagued, right? Long plagued by uh, political instability. Most of the economies focus on agricultural production. Uh, strategic important is the uh, Panama Canal, right? Which connects the Pacific and the uh, Atlantic via the Caribbean Basin, Caribbean Sea, and built in 1914. Uh, the canal is now too small for today's um, container ships. Um, just a little bit more in the Caribbean basin. Uh, it's made up of four uh, large islands. You got the Greater Antilles Islands and many smaller islands, the Lesser Antilles, settled by the Europeans to develop um, sugar plantations. And the subregion. And with the sugar plantations also came slave trade, right? The subregion also has, as a result of that, strong African cultural influence. Uh, tourism is an important part of that region. Uh, more, uh, it's a you know, major economic activity there. Uh, as few places in the Caribbean basin are uh, well endowed. Uh, with natural resources, uh, Puerto Rico is a unique is is also very unique in the region. Uh, it's a uh, Commonwealth of the United States, although uh, its political status is neither independent, neither independent nor fully integrated uh, within the uh, U.S. political system. Now, one of the regions I want to camp out on is uh, the Northern Andes subregion. Economic development, uh, export-led underdevelopment. Export-led underdevelopment. Um, developed on smuggling coca and cocaine across. Let's cap that there. Let's see. Yep, make that right. Developed on smuggling coca and cocaine arose the need for to find high volume product with you know, continuing demand uh, in the world markets and, and uh, continuing demand in wealthier countries, right? Uh, North, the North Andean countries that engage in deeper involvement in the world economic system were uh, often vulnerable. Enter Plan Patriot. In 2004, and I should probably back up, you know, the demand in wealthier countries. Well, the wealthiest country in the world is, you know, in, the, is in a hemispheric sense, is in your neighborhood, right? Uh, if you're, if you have these um, types of, um, well, what's the word I'm looking for here? Products, right? That uh, can create demand. The United States is the target, right? So enter Plan Patriot in uh, 2004. The U.S. military and uh, civilian contractors began working with the Colombian military, providing you know strong military training, uh, intel gathering, and uh, GPS. Uh, FARC FARC strongholds uh, were bombed, resulting in an improved security situation for the country uh, by late 2000s, 2008. Uh, much of Colombia South was uh, was taken back by the government. And of course, there were paramilitary uh, groups too, such as AUK, that were uh, dismayed, uh, disam dismantled and disarmed by, um, by 2006. It's kind of an FYI. FARC FARC became a um, 
narco terror group in the 80s as you know cocaine production was jacked up uh resorting to kidnapping uh extortion executions uh drug trade to fund its operations and uh it, it never caught on with the general population partly because it would target civilians uh, in the areas that it controlled So in 2012, the uh, the government launched several successful hits of FARC, prompting them to ask for a uh, peace settlement. In 2017, FARC surrendered its weapons to UN inspectors. It has since become a political party uh, with um, guaranteed numbers in the country's legislature and uh, until 2027. Um, the party looks to distance itself from its violent past. In 2021, it remained itself, renamed itself the Commoners, right? The Commoners, a reference to its origin as a voice for the peasants. So we hope that's legit. Not a all too often last bastion of um, the criminal, right? To care for the poor, at least say you care for the poor. Patterns of economic development and diversification. Uh, the Galapagos Islands in Ecuador, gorgeous place. Uh, unique animal and plant species uh, in that area. They attract scientists and tourists all over the world. I don't know if your author has any, any photos of that. Um, but, um, you know, if you get a chance, get, get, get some time when you're studying this, um, Google it, you'll find it just a gorgeous place. It's, um, but here's the thing about it is the reason why I'm mentioning it. It's uh, not only gorgeous, one of the reasons I'm mentioning it, it's, um, uh, it's a temptation for the government to, um, exploit the situation, right? By, uh, <laughs> by luring tourists. You know, and uh, tourists from all over the world. It's kind of a little bit like, um, you know, we looked at Antarctica, right? There's the temptation uh, yeah, to exploit it with a lot of tourism, except the Galapagos Islands is a lot more comfortable, right? A lot more comfortable to visit. So, and then thereby harming, you know, perhaps the pristine, you know, that... Uh, so it attracts the scientists, just its pristine bird life and you know so forth. Brazil. Brazil would be where we will finish today. Periods of um indebtedness and um Hyperinflation have been problematic um, since the uh, 1970s. The um, agricultural economy has um, uh, benefited uh, from a, uh, you know, from a pretty steady market. Exporting beef. Oh, orange juice, concentrate, and soybeans. Sugar, you know, sugar cane growth is, um, sugar cane growth is huge. I mean, if you take a look at, um, if you take a look at Brazil, it was kind of built on the sugar cane, right? It was kind of built on it. Uh, sugar cane growth, in Brazil has, for lack of a better way to say it, I was thinking about what wording to use, propelled the country's ethanol fuels, right? Propelled the country's ethanol fuels. And uh, recent oil fines, there's been recent oil fines there uh, that have solved Brazil's problems with fossil fuel shortages as well. The uh, country's large chunk of um, 
tropical rainforest is uh, centered there, All right? Centered there in the uh, Amazon River system. And that, that drains nearly uh, 3 million square miles. It's a greater volume of water than any, uh, any other river uh, in the world. About half of its basin right lies in brazil but it extends also into um into uh, nine countries so yeah brazil's co uh, economy is the the continent's largest development of the amazon uh, region involves exploitation of um you yeah, know of course minerals and uh, the destruction, possible destruction of rainforest and resettlement of populations from the overcrowded southeastern cities. So aiding the development is the um, uh, Trans-Amazon Highway. Interesting study as well. I could have, and I might do this because um, I'm taping this uh, um, as I'm taping this in the summer. I'm taping this in July. So by the time you guys see this, it'll be, it'll be after. It'll be after uh, Thanksgiving. I'm probably I'm, I'm I might uh, ex replace one of the film clips. I think I'm going to do that. So I'm going to have a film clip on the Trans uh, Amazon Highway. And it's basically a long, long dirt road, and some people have taken it and uh, found themselves getting stuck in mud. And anyway. Interesting. Uh, there's some documentaries on it, I think, too, or longer film clips than what I'm going to show. But um, I think I might go that. So by the time you are watching me, that's probably going to be your one of your things to look at via the video. So, um, yeah, several concerns that regard the Amazon region include destruction in the rainforest, uh, welfare of the Indians, trying to think some of the... Uh, recollecting here welfare of the indians um, um, failure of settlers to uh, grow crops on land and i believe that's it oh. and um do i have my graphic organizer you now i forgot to get that out the graphic organizer um yeah let's see yeah maybe it's gonna slip that out for those of you guys for those of you who need to see it and hear me do a recap yep here we go um cultural history the the uh, mayas the aztec the incas uh, the aztec became slaves of the spaniards uh, generally in Mexico, Central America, the Incas um, and the Mayas, South America, I mean, pretty much encompassing a 2,800 mile strip uh, along uh, the coast of Peru. Incas were very warlike. The Treaty of Tordesillas, kind of a demarcation line to allegedly keep the Spanish and Portuguese to Catholic Christian countries from fighting one another. Uh, Portuguese would be uh, east of Brazil and span the Spanish west. Uh, the Spanish were conquistadors. Uh, they appeared godlike. They had a rigid to the to the Indians, uh, rigid class structure. Uh, the haciendas were production estates, and the criollas were uh, your Spaniards that were born in the uh, Spanish colonies at the top of the. Uh, uh, social ladder, you had your mestitos, mestizos in the middle. Uh, it was a mixture of Spanish and Indian. And then, of course, the Indian, pure Indians were the slaves at the uh, the bottom. Independence for the region, right? Napoleonic Wars are draining the Spaniards back in Europe. Uh, you know, the Spanish set, start setting up vice royalties. There's, there are rebellions and, uh, in Central America and Mexico. Uh, Mexico, uh, you know, gets its independence in uh, uh, 1821. 
And then the Portuguese, Brazil gets independence in 1889 via military coup. And then after independence, you have the Andes Mountains, right? Uh, cultivating illegal drugs. Uh, tourism is big in, the Alep in Ecuador and the Galapagos Islands and other places. Um, you know, Brazil does in Ar Argentina, uh, some of the coastal areas, great with tourism. Mexico, you have the uh, the Diaz uh, uh, government, uh, very brutal, rigid, uh, leads to the 1911, and this is after gaining independence from Spain, leads to a 1911 revolution in, in Mexico, right? Hitos, um, uh, land to uh, peasants and co-ops are set up. Mexico City becomes the political, economic, and nerve center. Maculadoras, right, set up cheap labor, low regulations, parts assembly plants in uh, straddling the northern uh, Mexico border. And Brazil, uh, economic modernization uh, and manufacturing, uh, public investments, public involvement uh, leads to um, you know, a lot of government growth, a lot of government uh uh, and just over oh, oh, spending too much over lending leads to a financial collapse. Currency gets devalued. Uh, tariffs get lowered to try to bail it out. Uh, global influence at a region, Mexico City, Sao Paulo, Brazil, and the American influence on the region. Monroe Doctrine of 1823. Europeans, here's the deal. Uh, we want you to stay out of this uh, this region, in turn, we will not bother you guys over in Europe. Uh, Miami becomes a strong cultural link. Uh, U.S. becomes very influential in popular culture, um, politics, and uh, and trade. So, what's um, what's up ahead? You're reading um, NAFTA and. Um, USMCA, NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement between US, Canada, and Mexico. Uh, under the Trump administration, that was redone, right? That was redone. It's now the US, Mexico, uh, uh, Canadian. I can't remember how that ends up, but it's different today. It's a little different. Uh, the Trump administration, Trump looked at, uh, again, um, you know, how we were being taken to the cleaners here through that and, um, yeah, made some amendments to it. Change the name. Videos. Uh, one of them is going to be the Macro Ladora program um, or the political economic basis of Macro Ladoras. As I said, I'm going to change by the time you guys see this, I'm going to do away with one of those. And uh, the U.S. drug war. And I'm going to... Um, I'm going to have something on here about um, the um, highway, right? Going through the Amazon uh, Amazon River Basin, right? Which is pretty much a dirt road. Thursday in the news, Friday, your initial posts. Saturday, two initial posts. Uh, Monday, we will quiz and then begin North America, right? We'll uh, come home, right, on uh, Monday. Uh, your final will be about 90 minutes and it's going to be on um, Tuesday, December the 1st, right? Or no, it's December the 12th. I'm sorry, December the 12th. Saw so that one, not the two. December the 12th from 12.01, got all day to take it, okay? Any questions, comments, concerns? Um, you guys know, don't hesitate to uh contact me almost almost any way you like right so all right till next time have a great week